thank you very much. Um, I am very grateful to the President and Director of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland for inviting me to give this talk. I haven't asked them actually whether they know or knew that the beginning of last October was the 50th anniversary of my coming to Scotland to work, but the offer clearly allowed for some form of autobiographical content, if I wished. Though I don't think a full lecture on that theme would be anything like interesting enough, I can't resist sharing with you a couple of thoughts about how I came into this profession, simply to contrast the straightforward, relatively straightforward method of joining it in the late 1950s, when far fewer people went to university, of course, um, with the systematic and grueling obstacle course, which uh, seems to be the norm for students now. In my later school days, I wanted to be a paleontologist to dig up dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert. But by the time I made the effort to find out how to do this, I'd already taken my O-levels and had specialised in history and French for A-levels. I wrote for advice to Dr. W. E. Swinton, then a well-known paleontologist at the Natural History Museum, and he explained that I should have specialised in a science subject like zoology in order to hope for a curatorial post. However, he kindly offered to recommend I be taken on at a more junior level in a non-graduate post. When I consulted the careers master at school, he said, well, why don't you read archaeology instead? Whitgift has a link with St. John's College in Cambridge, and you can study it there. So as you can see from the letter on the right, I did, having secured the requisite old level in Latin, I don't think that's needed anymore, and good A-levels, and had a successful interview with Dr. Guilabo at the college. How comparatively simple it all was then. Oops. I have to admit that after three years of reading the Archaeology and Anthropology Tripos, which included tasks like having to learn all the fine typological divisions of the Hungarian Bronze Age in great detail, I was still not sufficiently motivated to work really hard and doubted whether a successful archaeological career was within my grasp. Then one morning in the summer term of my final year in 1959, a friend told me of a proposed year-long expedition, multidisciplinary expedition to what was then the colony of British Honduras in Central America. He was to have led the archaeological section, but had thought better of it. Would I be interested in going instead? Thus by chance I joined the group, went out there in August, having been given £600 for field work by the museum in Cambridge of which £200 had to be handed over to the expedition for travel expenses and maintenance. This seems a very small sum now, but £400 was quite a lot in 1959, even when you, especially when you realise that the weekly wage for a Maya Indian labourer in the colony was then £3.15 shillings, or £3.75. Thus I was able to begin a programme of excavations which lasted for several months at Shunan Tunic, a 1,500-year-old medium-sized Maya ceremonial centre close to the Guatemalan border. It was this first foray into excavation, into that peculiar patient and skillful activity which unravels the past of the site bit by bit and for the success of which the excavator has, or had then, sole responsibility that really at last fired up my enthusiasm and motivation and made me think this, this is what I really wanted to do. Clearly desk archaeology wasn't going to be a good prospect for me, I would have been no good at it. Direct contact with the primary evidence was essential and it's the importance of primary evidence which is really the theme of this talk. One last vignette of the chancy way my career developed half a century ago will suffice. I was back in Cambridge in April 1960 working on the Maya finds and drafting the report. There were a few people still there whom I knew, and we were having coffee by the river one morning, wondering about the future, when someone said to me, have you seen this advertisement in the Times for a museum position in Glasgow University? Of course I hadn't, 
and I made a note of the details, applied for the post of assistant at the Planetarian, succeeded, was up here on October the 1st and have been here ever since. This photograph is, is of the same spot by the River Cam, 49 years later in, 19, in 2009, with Australian grandchildren in evidence. My first encounter with the great prehistoric stone monuments of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland was, to my great relief, every bit as exciting and romantic as that encounter with the jungle-clad Maya ruins three years earlier, and I have retained that feeling ever since. The motivation to discover things about them remains as strong as ever. Some will doubtless say that viewing our discoveries in a romantic light can jeopardise objectivity. But I firmly believe that unless one always keeps in mind that one is uncovering traces of past lives, the work can become just an intellectual exercise in constructing sequences of material culture and economic activities and so on. The choice of the primary topic for this talk was left to me, and I want to discuss one which is comparatively new to me, how we consolidate and restore for public display our best ancient stone ruins, which include some of the most spectacular and well-preserved of their kind in Europe. I want to ask two questions. First, whether some of the restoration, most of it undertaken many decades ago, I hasten to add, may have unwittingly changed quite dramatically what was originally there. And second, whether we should mark in some way what has been changed and replaced so that any visitor who wants to can see what's original and what isn't. At present this is not possible in my experience and to answer the second question immediately I think it should be if we, if we give the primary evidence the importance it should have. I'll return to this topic later. Most of the fieldwork I've undertaken in Scotland since 1961 has been on Iron Age Brock, so three of the examples I shall cite come from this class of extraordinary and complex dry stone monuments. However, to offer some variety, I shall begin and end with a much older Neolithic site. The first prehistoric monument to illustrate my theme is the 4,000-year-old, actually 5,000-year-old, I think, in the earlier stages, Neolithic dry stone village of Scarabray in Orkney. The bottom picture is hut one as it is now, standing about seven to eight feet high all round and with the famous stone slab furniture intact. Most of the other seven houses are similar. About 15 years ago, I came across the engraving in the upper picture soon after of, the, of the same building soon after being exposed by a great storm in about 1850. You can see from this that parts of the wall have been extensively rebuilt, particularly the bit over the, there above the dresser. And it was this that made me think that the authenticity of Scottish prehistoric buildings arranged for display might sometimes be a problem. In fact, no great changes were made here. The higher parts of the wall give a guide to what has fallen above the so-called dresser. However, on principle, I, I think that some kind of marker, perhaps a seam of subtly different coloured cement or something could have been inserted between the original masonry and the new to show what was actually found. The principle was established back in the later 19th century at the standing stone alignments of Karnak in Brittany when A. Milne and Zachary Ruzik were raising and resetting many of the fallen monoliths. A plug of red cement was inserted into the re-erected ones so that one can now tell which stones are undisturbed. Gurness Brock, with nearby Midhau or Rause, is one of the two best preserved and displayed brocks in Orkney, and it's the only example I shall cite of a modern alteration which I believe to be misleading. Admittedly, the effect was achieved by covering up some significant although less spectacular evidence, rather than by altering the architecture, so nothing irreversible was done. The change was probably made to protect the original paved floor as visitor numbers increased. 
However, the fact remains that important evidence is now invisible. This can affect our understanding of the sight. We need to know something first about a controversy about Gurness in order to understand what I'm getting at. The top plan is a pre-war one by the Royal Commission it was made after the 1930s excavations. And it shows what one might call the traditional view of the evolution of the site based on the excavator's discoveries and the visible architectural features. The stump of the hollow wall rock tower is shown as the oldest building. I don't know whether you can see but the shading of that is actually different from the shading of the surrounding village. Uh, and the surrounding two masonry revetted ditches, the inner one there and the next one there, are also shown in that early shading. Overlapping masonry persuaded these early investigators that the complex village with its bastion wall around there was added to the site later. After the discovery in the early 1960s that rocks could have been deliberately pulled down to a safe height in the Iron Age, it could be assumed that this was what happened to Gurness. If so, the internal wooden roundhouse would have been removed and the stone debris could have been used to redesign the interior and build the external village. In the early 1980s, a powerful challenge to this traditional view was mounted by John Hedges, who argued that even hollow walled rocks could be very variable architecturally, as well as in height and date. There was therefore probably no such thing as a standardized rock tower. In particular, his detailed study of Gurness convinced him that the internal stone furnishings as well as the external village were primary features of the site. The implication was that the old idea of a broch containing a wooden roundhouse did not apply here. The bottom plan here is based on uh, Hedges' version of the history of Gurness. Essentially everything belongs to one major phase of occupation, particularly the, uh, all the slab compartments inside the rock, which are reckoned to be secondary in this old idea there. Essentially everything belongs to one major phase, albeit with minor reconstructions from time to time. Thus the, the great wave of anti-diffusionism and pro-local development, which gathered strength in British archaeological theorising during the late 1960s and the 1970s finally rolled over the Scottish Atlantic Iron Age and demanded and obtained a radical rethink about rocks. This recent view, well not recent, it's actually 1963, uh, of the interior of Gurness as it is, still is today, more or less, except for the floor, which I'll mention in a minute, shows it cluttered with massive stone slabs forming irregular partitions. Two halves, two halves, one there, one there, same down here. Uh, the, yes, there are two halves, and the internal stone stair can also be seen, that's, I uh, can't quite see it here, but there's a stone stair running up the inside face of the inner wall, as if it's been added in later. There are no signs of the uh, ring of post holes suitable for supporting the wooden, raised wooden floor, which is supposed to be the standard feature of Brock Towers in their primary phase. I must emphasize that my purpose in reviewing the evidence I'm about to describe is not to argue a particular case with the original nature of the Brock, but simply to show that there is such a debate and that evidence which is important, even vital to it, uh, is now concealed. These two plans of what the central court of Gurness Brock might have looked like originally make the two different viewpoints clear. Below is Hedges' plan, arguing that most of the stone slab partitions are original. Some kind of raised wooden floor resting on the stone slabs is suggested by this 
dotted line. In this view, there was really just a single main phase of occupation. Notice that there are two halves, as I've said, suggesting that more than one family occupied this cluttered space. Above is my interpretation of the uh, rock in its original form, with a wooden roundhouse in the interior, and these are the post holes uh, which have supported it. Uh, and the raised ring-shaped wooden floor or balcony which was arrested on the high scarceman ledge which you can't see here, we'll see in a minute um, and also on that ring of posts a single central half is assumed for that primary phase in this view there was a distinct primary and secondary occupation separated by an episode of demolition and the upper parts of the tower were taken down and the wooden roundhouse removed no, I didn't just pluck this alternative explanation out of thin air. There's quite a lot of circumstantial evidence and Gurness in favour of the traditional view. For example, the ground level gallery was blocked at some stage in the Iron Age. That's the rubble filling it. The lintels of it are still preserved up there with the rubble underneath. And this was evidently an attempt to prevent a collapse. And, um, would explain the eventual demolition. The tower was very high, the sandstone, Orkney sandstone wasn't uh, strong enough to keep it up, keep uh, it buckled under the weight. Also, why have a stone scarcement on the inner face? If you can just see where the raising rod is up here, rather warped, um, if there was no um, circular wooden structure to rest on it. The guard cells next to the entrance also showed severe signs of distortion due to partial collapse. However, my main point is that there is now no trace in the floor of the ring of post sockets that the wooden roundhouse theory requires. And this was doubtless one of the main reasons for the 1980s reassessment. Yet in 1963, when I first visited Gurness, the arrangement of the interior showed quite clearly that there was a primary floor with a central half about 30 centimetres below the upper paved floor then visible. And this is confirmed in the original excavation report. There was an ingenious sliding panel to show the original central half, which you can just see back there beyond the later half. So you look under there and there's the lower floor and the uh, central half, a part of it, was visible. This lower floor hardly seems to have been explored at all in the 1930s, presumably because there was a desire to preserve for public display the stone cubicles resting on the upper one. It could well contain the ring of post cells I mentioned. Subsequently, all these features uh, were covered with a layer of gravel, except the half, of course, which you see down below. Whatever the reasons for this change, the fact remains that what one sees now is slightly misleading. The two rival interpretations of Gurness in its original state are fundamentally different. They each carry quite different implications for the nature of rocks throughout <coughs> Atlantic Scotland. In 19, I think it was 1996, a colleague and I put forward a plan to test a few theories, hypotheses I should say, by excavating a clear segment of the interior and exploring the lower floor to see if there was a ring of posts there. However, Historic Scotland declined the offer, so the issue remains unresolved. Here's a recent reconstruction of Gurness, which was applied to me by Historic Scotland, no hard feelings, obviously, showing the bastion walled village as if a primary construction and the brock as tower-like but fairly low perhaps a compromise between the two opposing views of what it was like in, in its original form. I haven't been to Gurness for a while, shall do this summer, so I'm not sure if the hidden information is referred to in the official guidebook or on the notice board. It certainly used not to be. I want to now to look briefly at another well-known brock, Duntelve, near the village of Glenelg in western Inverness Shire. The mistaken restoration here is relatively minor, 
but it does give us a chance to look at this splendid structure in its dramatic highland setting and also to see the value of the descriptions of early pre-restoration visitors to the site. This rock is one of the best preserved that we have, but only about one quarter of its high wall still stands. The rest is only about two meters high, and that's in the foreground in, in that picture. There's the low part in front of its neighbour, Duntrodden, has been damaged in a similar way. We know, we know the reason for at least some of this damage. Thomas Pennant visited Duntelve and Duntrodden in 1772 while probably staying at the Redcoat Barracks in Glenelg village, a couple of miles away. And he has left us a detailed description of the two ruins and elaborate drawings of each. He says that Duntel was damaged in 1772 when, quote, some goth purloined from the top some seven and a half feet under pretense of applying the material to certain public buildings. Fortunately, the high part of the wall of Duntel contains the entrance passage so that we can get a good impression from this characteristic aspect of Brock Tower archaeology. This also happens to be the place where restoration has altered the masonry so that the entrance is not now what it was originally. These two views from the interior show what looks like a very high passage going up to there, the lintels up at the top. But this is not the case. There were no lintels at the level of the massive outer one here and you can see the stumps of them projecting to the wall. The idea of this uh, chamber over the entrance, of course, was to relieve the flat lintels of the passage below from the enormous weight of the high wall up above. The wooden floor which doubtless rested on the internal scarcement gave access to this stone chamber, from the interior only, of course, which otherwise uh, has only an opening to the left. You just see there, leading to the gallery, first floor gallery on the left hand side or south side. There is an even earlier account of both Brocks. Alexander Gordon visited them in 1720 before they had been damaged so we have the earliest detailed descriptions of two of these Iron Age towers when they were more or less intact. At that time there was at least two meters of debris concealing the base of the tell so the main entrance was inaccessible and probably invisible. The drawings show this. On the left is Alexander Gordon's illustration of 1720 and on the right Thomas Pennant's of 1772. Gordon shows the hollow or gallery wall resting directly on the ground whereas we now know that there is a massive solid base under this then completely buried. Thus Gordon described an exploration inside the tower at first floor level even though he assumed he was at ground level. I will read this account but we shall see better what he was doing with the aid of a modern plan made early in the 20th century. On the left is a plan of the tower at ground level showing the massive solid wall base two meters high. On the right is a plan at first floor level the height of which the first intramural gallery is founded and the height of the scarcement on the inside wall face which is clearly shown in this, this line here runs all the way round. The main entrance is at the bottom and the stair door is at 9 o'clock on the left the entrance of course being 6 o'clock. Gordon says, quote, I was in I was surprised to find no windows on the outside nor any manner of entrance into the fabric except a hole towards the west at the base." Unquote. Evidently the outer end of the entrance was almost completely buried at this time and Gordon did not notice its massive lintel. He got in through a hole at first floor level on the northwest, somewhere over there. The entrance is visible in Pennant's drawing which we saw just now, uh, so it may have been partly cleared by 1772. 
Gordon continues, referring to the hole he crept through, quote, so very low and narrow that I was forced to creep in on hands and knees and found that it carried me down four or five steps below the surface of the ground, unquote. Thus he got inside the hollow wall several feet above the solid base and landed on the second flight of the internal stair which has now completely vanished up there somewhere where it rises through the first gallery. He went down several steps underground as he thought and arrived on the floor of the first gallery as he makes clear. We now know that he was standing on the landing between the first and second flights of stairs. First one there, second one gone. I'll come back to this business of the landing in the stairway. It's quite important later on. The bottom flight of steps shown there on the, on the left must have been invisible then and buried by debris. When I uh, quote, when I got within, I was environed betwixt two walls having a cavity or void space which led me round the whole building. He's now moving anti-clockwise through the first floor gallery, which is still preserved here. Presumably, uh, he was in, in, in near darkness. And he says again, opposite to the little entry on the outside was a pretty large door in the second or inner wall. That's this, big opening here. That's the chamber over the entrance, which we looked at before, which led me into the inner court, the area or inner court, close quote. This must be the large chamber above the blocked entrance, which opens only to the interior. Quote, when I was there, I perceived that one half of the building was fallen down and had the opportunity thereby of seeing a complete section thereof, close quote. This last remark clearly doesn't mean that the whole wall had collapsed, Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able. To, he would have been able to see into the interior from the outside, as you can now. Only the inner half of the hollow wall had fallen, so that he could see the remains of the superimposed intramural galleries, exposed as it were in longitudinal section. This all seems fairly straightforward, except for one awkward fact: there is now no access from the first floor gallery to the chamber over the entrance. There's a thick block of masonry just there. Does this mean that Gordon's account is unreliable? It seems rather unlikely as it fits with every other aspect of the site's architecture. Or has the junction of first floor gallery and chamber over the entrance since been blocked up? It sounds as if it was open in Pennant's time in 1772 as he says that the first floor gallery went right round the building. However, by 1916, when the Office of Works plan was preserved, was prepared, the chamber above the entrance was inaccessible to the gallery on the north side because of this block of masonry. Is there any independent evidence of Duntel's uh, condition of the entrance here in its original state? Joseph Anderson's 1883 work, Scotland in pagan times, the Iron Age, reproduces a plan and elevation by Romilly Allen of this entrance to Duntell, which clearly shows that the first floor gallery connects with it on both sides. There's the one we saw in the photograph, here's the one which is now blocked. That's in the inner, inwards to the central court. Thus the north opening must have been blocked up some years after that. Presumably by Office of Works Masons consolidating and stabilising the building early in the 20th century. I admit that this is not a serious alteration. It doesn't really detract from the fact that Duntel, together with his neighbour Duntrodden, gives us what is probably the best impression of the architecture of a hollow walled broch which is now available. However, the fact remains that one element of the original Iron Age design has been changed. I think this should be explained somewhere on the site. I now want to look at Duncarnaway Broch in Lewis, and here the tower has, by contrast with Duntel, 
been so fundamentally altered by modern reconstruction that it now gives a very misleading impression as to how this Iron Age tower actually worked for its inhabitants. At present, I feel it actually detracts from the picture of a highly sophisticated and standardised architecture that most of the well, rest of the well-preserved blocks give. And this recent error in reconstruction could be used to cast doubt on the otherwise highly plausible theory that rock towers were designed to com contain complex wooden roundhouses with at least one upper floor. However, before pursuing this point, we have to look briefly as another aspect of specialised rock architecture in order to make it all a bit clearer. These two diagrams attempt to show the bottom two storeys of a hollow wall brock with a solid base as they might have appeared when under construction. The one at the bottom shows the wall built up to the base of the first floor level up to 1.8 metres or 6 feet and the upper diagram shows it built up to the bottom of level 3 up to about 3.6 metres or say 12 feet up there. We already looked at the design of the entrance passage, which is shown at the bottom left here, with these arrows imagining people going in. Um, the lower drawing shows how the floor of the chamber over the entrance, formed by the lintels of the passage below, is starting to be built. On the upper drawing shows the chamber roofed with its own the chamber over the entrance roofed with its own lintels. The raised ledge or scarcement on the inside wall face is also shown, together with a ring-shaped wooden floor, which one assumes rested on it, and on the ring of posts in the primary floor. Duntroddenbroch nearby produced just such a circle of post holes. However, the feature I would like to look at in, in this is the intramural stone stair, and how this seems to have been designed provide access to just such a raised wooden floor, thus providing valuable evidence, in addition to the scarcement, for, this, for the existence of that vanished floor and for what I call the standardised nature of Brock Tower architecture, an, an, an amalgam of stone tower and wooden roundhouse. Um, it is sometimes said that a Brock Tower is composed, or implied let's say, sometimes implied that the Brock Tower is composed of a collection of bizarre architectural features in various combinations, but I don't think that's right. They all combine into one simple and ingenious overall design, albeit with minor variations in detail. So how does this intramural stair work? A number of well-preserved sites show how the first flight of steps ends at a landing. So this is a stair door here. The first flight of stairs is mostly hidden. A few top steps shown there. Then there's a long landing made of paving, in this case, before the second flight starts to go up here. The, uh, on this landing, there is a raised doorway. The foundations of it being shown here, shown complete there. And this allows you to go up the stair onto the landing, out to the raised door, and onto your uh, raised wooden floor. That's confirming that there was once a raised wooden floor on, on, the, uh, on the ledge. These two drawings, we see the stair door at ground level and the raised doorway at first floor level. The whole purpose of this arrangement, it seems to me, was to give solid and dignified access to the wooden first floor and to the private apartments that were doubtless on them. After the landing, as I explained, the stair continues its ascent, is it coming into level three here, probably to the top and breaking through each of the raised intramural galleries in turn. An actual example should make this arrangement clear. Midhow in Orkney it has an unusual raised stair floor, stair door, sorry, nearly two metres above the present paved floor, but slightly higher above the original one underneath. There's also a double floor 
I, I was journeying. Here's the raised door that was leading to the stairway, which you can't actually see. Well, there are the steps in the other, the other picture there. The raised door is at the bottom. So you would really need uh, an internal ladder or a more solid wooden flight of steps to get from a floor level up to the sill of this upper door leading to the stone stair. The scarcement, the of course, is even higher. Very unusual to have this high, great high scarcement, about 11 feet above the floor. And there it is, well preserved, running all the way around here. And the stair lead, leads up to this just round the corner, the same height as the scarcement. Unfortunately, not enough stonework remains on the present wall head for any clear traces of the landing to be preserved, but there is a fragment of the base of the connecting doorway, which is in fact visible in both pictures. This is the edge of it here, not really quite so well visible over there, but there's the edge of it. So again, up a wooden flight of stairs, into a stone stair, up to a landing and through onto the wooden floor resting on the ledge. But one of the curious aspects of Dun Carloway in its present ruined and partly restored condition is that there's no sign of this arrangement. In this general view of the interior, which I've downloaded both these uh, photographs from the internet, which is very useful if you don't have any of your own. Um, in this general view of the interior, the inner wall on the right, the doorway should be visible in it. Uh, there is the stair door there. Um, the, the first flight of stairs goes up, then there's, there's a landing there, and the next flight starts. Uh, but there's no sign of a raised doorway. The scarcement is about here, not too clear on this picture. And there's the internal view. There is the landing made, landing made of lintels, because there's a hollow underneath, at first floor level, there's the second flight going up, not a sign of any um, doorway out onto the, onto the scarcement. Does this mean that access to a raised wooden floor is not a standard feature of Tower Rocks after all? No modern visitor could deduce such a connection at Uncarloway, and he or she might well end up concluding that at this site, one of the five best preserved rocks itself does not possess this basic feature, <coughs> then the various hollow-walled architectural phenomena do indeed occur in almost random combinations, and there's no such thing as a standard Baroque tower. These two photographs, as I said, from the internet demonstrate the absence of the door at scarcement level. <coughs> the inner face, as I said, above, and the interior view on the right. Luckily, there are some early descriptions, good early descriptions of Dun Carloway, with illustrations, which might tell us more about its original condition. The site was first visited and described by Colin Mackenzie in 1781. I think he was the local minister. And his sketch shows that the Brock was somewhat better preserved than it is now. That's the drawing on the left. It also implies that later restoration did not replace some important features which had doubtless fallen in the intervening years. 220 years ago there were three superimposed voids. There are now only two. Moreover, there's a second set of which there's no sign at all now. The lintel of the stair door can be seen just above the debris which is filling the interior. And there is the scatterment running around just above it. More important, there was, a, there was another set of three voids to the right of that door where there's now nothing. One assumes that this second set of openings had already disintegrated and the carloway was cleared out, perhaps in the later 19th century. If so, much of the inner wall face along the southeastern arc may be modern. Might this explain why there's no, no raised door to the interior from the stair landing? The second set of voids may have been above such a door, though the drawing looks, shows it rather too far to the left, above the stair door itself. 
Mackenzie's draftsman clearly shows the scarcements in the lintel of the stair door, so careful notes were taken during the visit. Fortunately, there is much more positive evidence available. Then Carloway was surveyed again, but more systematically, and described in about 1861 by Captain F. W. L. Thomas of the Royal Navy. The longitudinal elevation which he gives us is a simple plan here. It has to be at first floor level because, like Dun tells, Dun Carloway was then full of debris. Um, the longitudinal elevation, together with his description, which uh, the, the elevation is shown as if the inner half of the wall has been removed, so we've seen a section with, without the inner shell of masonry, as it were, various galleries and so on, preserved. This makes it clear beyond doubt that about 150 years ago, both the first floor landing and the raised door leading to the scarcement were present and intact. We have to remember that the interior was full of rubble then, so the lower part of the wall could not be shown. The long landing at first floor level is clearly shown there. First flight of steps, landing, second flight. That's what we saw and we saw the landing in the second flight in the previous picture. No inner doorway can obviously be shown in this picture because the inner half of the wall has been removed. Yet the verbal description is quite unequivocal. Now, Captain Thomas says, quote, right opposite to the main door, at a height of three feet from the ground, as is above the rubble filling the interior, is a doorway through the inner wall two and a half feet square. This lands on the floor of the second gallery, counting, the, uh, counting that on the ground level as the first. To the left, a flight of steps descends to the ground gallery down there. In other, end of quote. In other words, he's gone through the scarcement doorway onto the landing of lintels and seen the, scare, the stair going downwards to the left towards the stair door, which was then invisible. He goes on, quote, turning to the right, the flight of steps leads to the third gallery, that's this one going up, which is two and, a half, two and three quarter feet wide and seven feet high. This clearly describes the stairway continuing upwards after the landing. He doesn't say if there were voids above this doorway, raised doorway, it seemed quite likely, and there may be the one, second set shown by Mackenzie if those were displaced. But at two and a half feet high, this raised doorway seems remarkably low, and one wonders if some previous landowner had repaired it and set the lintel too low, thinking only a void or window. Impossible to tell at this stage. So it's clear that what we see at Dun Carloway is radically different now than what was there originally. And this block was a standard hollow wall tower containing a two or multi-story wooden roundhouse, and complete with access to the first raised wooden floor by way of stair, landing and raised doorway. The right hand plan here by me shows the first floor level probably as it was originally. <coughs> Ground floor here of course. So in here, here we have the uh, Stair door at ground level, go in, under lintels, up the first flight of stairs, here's a landing, and the landing should be shown lintel, there's a mistake there, because there's a space underneath, and then the doorway coming in to the raised floor resting on the scarcement, exactly as in um, Duntel and in uh, Midhau and Gurness. To say all this is not to criticise the organisation which looks after the Brock either the present historic Scotland or its predecessor, the Ministry of Works. Dun Carloway must have been cleared out long before these bodies existed, probably under the old Office of Works in the early part of the 20th century, and when the understanding of block architecture was not as developed as it is now. It's perhaps an extreme argument to say that the historical evidence is clear enough to justify reconstructing the inner wall on the south side and putting back the raised doorway leading out to the scarcement, as shown in the, in the plan, that would give archaeologists and visitors alike a much better understanding of how the Brock Tower 
actually works. As a protective stone shell for a two or three multi-story, two or multi-story wooden roundhouse. Apart from Musa in Shetland and Calloway is the only rock <coughs> where the stair landing scarce with an upper door leading to it could be shown complete. Certainly we, need, we probably need something on the site to show how this broch used to be. The last site I want to look at is one of the most famous Neolithic tombs, chamber tombs in Northern Europe. Mai's Howe in Orkney is such a well-known site, not least because of the way the setting midwinter sun shines down the entrance passage in a very dramatic way, that it may seem incredible that anything could be wrong with the restored version they are so familiar with. Again, this restoration, I think, goes back many, many decades, probably to the uh, 20, 1920s or even, even before that. Yet the drawings of the entrance passage which were made when the site was first systematically studied in the middle of the 19th century do show something quite different from what is there now. Here is a general view of the mound with another below of the main chamber showing the amazingly high quality of the masonry with uh, formed of horizontal close fitting sandstone slabs and these things that look like standing stones facing the four buttresses in each corner of the chamber. To see Mai's house as it is now, we can't do better than to look at the plan and elevation prepared by the Royal Commission in 1929. It shows the characteristic square chamber made of these neatly fitting sandstone slabs with its peculiar buttress in each corner, each face with an enormous standing stone. The three side chambers there, 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 give the whole thing this characteristic cross-shaped pattern. The entrance passage, the inner part of which is formed of three enormous single slabs, the third one forming a roof, is about 37 feet long with a recess for a stone slab door can't see it there, but it's shown in profile there, near, near the actual checks of the door, after which the outer part of the passage narrows a bit. There's a slight angle between the inner and outer straight sections of the entrance, uh, and immense roofing slabs cover it, which are all on the same level. The passage ends a short distance in front of the frame to the stone door, just about here. And at the inner end, it narrows because of two colossal slabs which are set slightly inward just before the main chamber. It's well known that Maishau <coughs> is orientated towards the prehistoric midwinter solstice. The passage points towards sunset on the shortest day of the year. <coughs> at present, the sun on the horizon shines almost straight down the outer end of the passage but only a small part of the beam reaches the back of the main chamber. This is because the inner part of the passage is angled slightly to the left, as seen from the outside, so that most of the sunlight hits the huge monoliths on the right. And this is the narrow bit just before the main chamber, one of the slabs forming the narrow bit. Because of the precession of the equinoxes, which I am not going to explain, Midwinter sunset 5,000 years ago occurred slightly to the left of its modern position. So, although it would then have been aligned exactly down the outer part of the passage, it would have shone even more askew down the inner part than it, is, than it does here. might not have got into the chamber at all. That's rather a puzzle. However, I'm not worried about that on this occasion. Everything seemed seems fairly straightforward at the site now, and Mai's house is still routinely interpreted as an architecturally highly sophisticated chambered tomb, the primary purpose of which was presumably for burials. The orientation towards midwinter sunset is paralleled by several other chambered tombs, most notably by New Grange in Ireland, with its unique light box over the entrance. 
except a new grange, uh, is orientated towards midwinter dawn, not sunset. However, these comments about how the sun once shone and now shines down the passage obviously rely for their accuracy on the passage having been the same 4,700 years ago as it is now. Unfortunately, it was not. A certain uneasiness about the present arrangement comes if one considers the massive stone slab in its recess in the right side of the passage just inside the door chamber. There it is, huge slab thought to be the stone door. No hinges, of course, it would have to be manhandled round. This must surely be a stone door, although it does not easily suit a purely funerary interpretation, since, since it can only be laboriously heaved out of its recess and moved round to be propped against the door checks from inside the passage. This would now leave daylight to enter through a fairly narrow slit above the door between about this height and the height of the lintels. That would leave those in the chamber to conduct their funerary ceremonies in almost total darkness, though doubtless with torches. I don't know of any other comparable door slab, would be interested to hear if anyone does, and this together with the extraordinary architectural sophistication of the structure seems to suggest that Maya's house also intended for some kind of solar temple inside which at sunset on the shortest day of the year the religious elite of Neolithic Orkney would gather to watch the phenomenon and celebrate the turning of the year. In view of what's currently being discovered at the excavations of Nessa Brodga, the idea of a Neolithic temple in Orkney is not as fantastic as it once seemed. However, we need to see what the original investigators of Meisau saw there in the middle of the 19th century. There are two sets of published drawings by George Petrie and by someone called Gibb, made when Meisau was first investigated in about 1860. There are a number of differences from the modern plan, but I here I want to concentrate only on two. The first is the much longer entrance passage shown in both these early drawings. The lower outer part is only about two and a half feet high from contemporary description, protects, projects some 25 feet beyond the present door checks, according to Petrie's survey, though well, even then most of the lintels had, uh, had vanished. Gibbs' drawing does not show all the outer section, although he does show the stone cairn which encloses the inner passage in the chamber, extending more or less to where it does now, just outside the door checks. The massive stone slab was found flat on the passage floor, but was returned to its recess. If we put the <coughs> 19th and 20th century elevations side by side, the differences become very obvious. The lower outer part of the longer entrance passage has entirely disappeared. There's the doorway, the door checks there, and there they are shown in the old drawing. And almost everything beyond this point is gone. We now have a fairly neat outer end to the passage wall there. Moreover, it is there at the junction of the inner and outer parts of the passage, that something else appears which has also vanished, an apparent overlap between the upper and lower lintels, leaving a gap between. These are all still in position, huge monolithic slabs. There's the uh, level of the outer lintels, which are nearly all gone in 1860, except for that one, which was still in position. Peach's drawing distinctly shows one of these lower lintels in position below the huge upper one, and his notebook confirms this. It suggests something rather like the light box of the entrance of New Grange in Ireland, where the rising midwinter sun could shine into the main chamber, even if the outer part of the passage was blocked. Could this 
historical evidence mean that Maisau was an Orkney equivalent in New Grange. And at the bottom here, of course, is the longitudinal section of the famous tomb at New Grange with the corbel chamber at that end, the passageway, and this extraordinary uh, opening above the massive main entrance. Sorry, the opening is here, with little lintels on top of it. Uh, the opening allows the uh, light to come in and shine down into the chamber on midwinter's morning. Certain features of my style could make more sense with this idea, for example, the stone door. We've seen, and you can see here, shown as if it was in position against the checks here, in a black uh, cross section. It's not high enough to block the inner passage. And the gap above could support the light box hypothesis, with the slab blocking the lower outer passage letting the light of the setting sun, shown in this imaginary orange beam, go through the rectangular slit. There would then be no contradiction between an elite being shut inside the chamber of Myers Tower at midwinter and they're being illuminated by the setting sun. Moreover, the experience would have been much more striking because those concerned would have had to crawl down the outer part of the passage and then be shut in. I'm not proposing to argue here that that is how Meisau worked in the Olympic times, only that it is a distinct possibility, which has emerged, which can only emerge when the historical evidence about the original condition of the site when first explored is examined. It's all in our society's journal. As with Dun Carlway and Gurness Brox, knowing the original condition of these great stone constructions from prehistory is vital to understanding how they worked and therefore to our understanding of their place in prehistoric society. I hope I've given you enough examples to convince you that what we see at some of our best preserved prehistoric sites is not necessarily always what the ancient designers and architects constructed. Some thought ought to be given to making this clear both to the archaeological profession and to the interested public which visits them. And the last slide shows how they do it in Peru. Um, this is the Huaca de la Luna in northern Peru and it's being restored. It's a gigantic pyramidal structure of mud brick and they are making fresh mud bricks on the left there in moulds. And each of these new ones has a year stamped into it before it's put into the uh, a restored part of the pyramid. And on the right are ancient pre-Inca mud bricks which what look like uh, masons or not masons but craftsmen's marks on it. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>